Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 8. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 8. When thou buildest a new house, then thou shalt make a battlement for thy roof, that thou bring not blood upon thine house, if any man fall from thence. Thou shalt build a battlement. It says make. That means it's a process. A battlement for thy roof. Because it would be a tragedy if someone fell from thence. Everybody, now that I've got you so solemn and sad, put a smile on your face. Sister Rosie, smile at Brother Larry. <laughs> Tough thing to do this morning. <laughs> and God bless you. You may be seated. So let's go to our text this morning. To properly understand these words that I've used this morning in relationship to our time, we should always remember that these scriptures, especially in Deuteronomy, were being spoken thousands of years ago. In, it was in reference to the Eastern culture of the world. And in that day and time, and, and to a great degree, even today in the eastern lands, houses are predominantly flat when they're built. And on the top of these houses, now, you folks here, us Cajuns in South Louisiana, if we had a flat roof on our houses, we would drown within one given year and four hurricanes later. That's about what would happen to us because it just wouldn't make it. But in those lands, in those dry, arid lands, the roofs were usually flat. And in fine weather, the inhabitants would resort to those flat roofs to breathe the fresh air, to witness events in the neighborhood. These roofs had purpose and they had reason. Many times you would find that they were used for drying grains such as flax and wheat and oat and barley and rye and possibly even some... Uh, See, uh, uh, corn, I, I, you know, Spanish words come first to a botanist. But predominantly, all of these different grains were used by the people to eat, of course, but they had to dry them out. And they would bring them up on the top of the roof, and there they would dry them. And, and the roofs were used for oversight and for viewing the neighborhood. In fact, it was really an issue in some ways because we read even in the evening it was a place to resort because the Bible said David was walking on the roof of his house. Now, you guys, you got to picture this. Get away from the 4 by 12, uh, 6 by 12, 8 by 12. Brother Brian knows about much about that stuff. And, and I'm not talking about, can you imagine us walking on our roofs? We'd, we'd have people everywhere in the hospitals. <laughs> but these roofs were flat. And David, the Bible says he was on the roof of his house when he fell into temptation that led him to his great sin with Bathsheba. Now, it's interesting, whenever the word of God was first presented to the Gentiles, the Lord had to get a preacher off of the roof of his house. That's what the Bible says. 
It says that Peter was on his housetop praying. That's a good place to pray on your roof. In those days, it was very common because so much happened on the roof. And then he had, the Bible said, a remarkable vision that led to the opening of the door of salvation to the entire Gentile world. In fact, that's so important. Let me read it. Acts chapter 10 and verse 9. And on the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, this was the, the, the servants of Cornelius, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray in about the sixth hour. That's so interesting. Is that not interesting? You look so excited. This, this 830 crowd looks so excited. You woke up about 30 minutes ago and you just got here. Some of you skipped coffee. Don't do that anymore. <laughs> now the Old Testament, as I said in my text, God ordered a battlement. In other words, a railing, a parapet, a fence. Why didn't they just say a fence? And it was built around the roof to protect people's lives. You and I today, we need to take the semblance of this scripture and all the symbolism involved and we need to build or to erect a battlement around our lives, around our children, around our family, around our homes, around our churches. If there's ever been a time in this hour we live in, in a world so chaotic and so confused, in a world where there's not any more right and wrong, in a world like where you can go to Seattle and seemingly the greatest heroes are the shoplifters that's stealing from everybody else in a big city. What a day we live in whenever our younger generation doesn't understand that there's a right and there is a wrong. There's a hot. There's a cold. There's a heaven. There's a hell. There's righteousness. There's unrighteousness. There's good. Good. There is evil. What an hour. They've lost their boundaries. They've lost their direction. They're walking around in this world and one after the other is falling off the edge. What a day. What a day. What a day whenever you can look at someone and they can really question in their mind, is it all right to kill a baby? What a world we live in. I know it's not popular, but what a day we live in whenever it is so chaotic that you don't even know what a family is anymore. Whenever the Bible was so clear and so concise that it said a man is to marry a woman. What a day we live in. If there's ever been a time we need boundaries. If there's ever a time we need guidance, we need direction. What a day whenever you wonder, because even in your government, it is not appropriate anymore to say Jesus in a public government facility or to display the Ten Commandments. Yet the Bible is so quick to say righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. If there's ever a time we need a battlement, if there's ever a time we need boundaries, those boundaries need to be presented today. One of the first things we need to erect is the battlement of the love of God. 
don't confuse the word love with that mushy, ignorant stuff of this day and this hour. I was back years ago, almost a century ago, whenever I was counseling someone and, and there was a man and a woman somewhere between the North Pole and South Pole. And the man looked at me and looked at his wife and he said, I just don't love her anymore. And I mean, something just went all over me. The pastor, Brother Jeremy, rose up in me. Then I calmed myself down a little bit. And I said, why, sir, would you want to disobey God? He looked at me, well, uh, I mean, I used to love her. No, you were infatuated with her. But quite obviously, you never loved her. Because God is not going to command. I use that word, command. You to do something you cannot do. Because the Bible commands, husband, love your wife. Woo. What a day. This is an odd message. But it's a message from an old man to all of our fathers in this church. You're commanded to love your wife. <laughs> Uh-oh, I'm going to get over here for a little while. Yeah. Whew, I'm feeling a little better now. Just picking, just picking. Oh, my, there's a big difference between infatuation and love. Now, quite obviously, you don't necessarily have to like them. <laughs> but you still got to love them. And then love is such a misunderstood word. It's so mushy, so goofy, so stupid. Whenever the Bible speaks of love, it talks about God so loved the world that he had a good little feeling about you. First John chapter 3 and verse 16 says, Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. You want to recognize love? Look at the cross. Look at Calvary. Look at what God did for this world. It wasn't just some little goofy feeling. I just don't, I just don't love him anymore. Can you imagine if God would have said that? No, here, for God so loved the world that he gave. And we can just stop right there. That he gave. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 35 says, then one of them, people that were speaking to Jesus, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him. I wonder how many times in prayer. <laughs> oh, I'm getting right in your visit, Pastor Jared. I'm trying not to pastor here. But I wonder how many times in prayer we're just tempting God. Tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment of the law? I mean, after all, there's 10 of them, you know. And, and, and let's rank it. Which is the great commandment in the law? Oh, Jesus saw right through that, even before he said it. I could go on with that, even before the world was. Even while he was in the womb of his mother, Jesus knew this question was coming. And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This 
is the first and great commandment. Now, if you're to love the Lord, there's some things that come along with it. Because if you're to love God, you're going to hate the world and you're going to hate sin. Psalm 97 and verse 10 says, Ye that love the Lord. Hey, it's directly related. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of a saint. He delivereth them out of the land of the wicked. So if you say you love God, you're going to hate evil, not people. Evil. You see, you love the sinner, but you hate their sin. You understand? With all your heart, you love people. You love that person that is living in darkness and in the world and away from God. You love them to God. It's your love for them that's going to reach them. It's not looking down your nose at them. You look down at the sin, but you look at an even level, at the, at the foot of the cross. We're all the same. We're all at an even keel. We're all at even, even level. We all have to look up to Jesus hanging on the cross, but we're all the same at the level of the cross. And so you reach them with love. Hate evil. Well, that's a tough word. That's not a popular word. Well, there's a lot of hate today. It's just not defined as hate. You know, all this stuff going on in the media and in society. Don't worry, Pastor Jared, I'm going to be very careful. I, I, I am apolitical. But I am anti-sin. And I'm anti-evil. And I'm anti-wickedness. The vast majority of this nation has feelings of concern and love for their country and for their neighbor. The vast majority. But there are those on one side cheering evil on. And there's those on the other side cheering evil on. It's kind of like what Brother Tinney said years ago. He said, I know there's always going to be a, a right wing and I know there's always going to be a left wing. And he said, I'm not that concerned about that right wing. And I'm not that concerned about that left wing. I'm worried about the whole bird. <laughs> That's what I'm worried about, is the whole bird. And so this nation predominantly is a, a Christian nation. But they have been so silenced. Because if you say something about God, you're looked down upon. But predominantly, this is still a Christian nation. You don't see it in statistics. Google it. You don't see it in statistics. Because if someone were to call most people on the phone and say, are you a Christian? First word you would say is, oh, oh uh, no, 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 you know. Because we're pushed down. And push down. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be this way forever because we're at the tipping point, folks, because there is no parapet, there is no battlement. There is no boundary. Our nation that was founded upon laws and justice and freedom for all is no longer that nation because it's a nation in chaos and in confusion. And people are wondering what is right, what is wrong. Whenever your children are taught in public schools that a, a natural family is two men. Or a natural family is two women. It used to be no question. If you're going to have a family, it's going to be mom and dad and the children. What an hour. What a day. Amen. Now, now I'm a lot older than most of you. And I, I remember the days in the early 70s. Whenever this nation was still a nation of Christian principles. And it was a wonderful thing. If you heard that children were praying in school, every, in fact, when I was a little boy, whenever I was in elementary school, Mrs. Schaefer, whoo, 
that lady was our principal. And she was about nine feet tall, <laughs> weighed about 400 pounds, and it was all muscle. <laughs> Whew. I can still remember that one time that I was called into the office. And I can still remember when she came with that paddle that was six feet wide. Now look, when a nine foot woman has a six foot wide paddle and you're about four foot tall, I, I think I fainted. She never touched me. She never bothered me. I think when I woke up, she said, I scared you enough. <laughs> but I can still remember every morning, every morning when we got to school and it would be five after eight, I'd hear the little tap on the little microphone thing, monitors in every room. Tap, 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 tap. Children, stand up. We're going to pray. That was her next words. We're going to pray this morning. And for five minutes, that woman prayed. And for five minutes, that whole school prayed. And if anybody didn't pray, they'd have wished they'd have prayed. Because they'd be praying afterwards. That was the way we were raised. And oh, what a day it was. It was a Christian world. There was a boundary set. There was a parapet set. There was a battlement that was built around our schools, built around our churches, built around our families, built around our children. What an hour. No one questioned right or wrong, good or evil, bad or good. It was understood. It made no difference what denomination. It made no difference what religion. It was because the fact it was a Christian concept. A battlement was built. You see, to love God means to offer him wholehearted service. I'm talking about love. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12 says, and now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? What is God requiring of you? Now we're spiritual Israel. And what is God requiring of me and of you 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 and all of you? What is God requiring? But to fear the Lord thy God. And to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Now, wait a minute. Wasn't that what Jesus was saying? Nothing changed. God has always expected his people to love him to serve him, to worship him with all their heart and with all their soul. Dispensations never change that. God is still God. And no matter where you are, no matter what year you ever lived in in the past, you were still a human being and you were to love God and you were to serve him and to worship him with all your heart and with all your soul. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, we do it because of God's mercy, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable. Everybody say reasonable. Which is your reasonable service. It's not something strange odd it's a reasonable service that we present ourselves to God a living sacrifice it is a fact and this is really interesting 
that in a relationship, whether a marriage or even a courtship, the person, listen carefully now, the person least committed to the relationship controls the relationship. Check it out. Think of any incident in your mind. The one least committed controls it. Because the one committed, I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere. I'll do whatever you say. I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm, I'm for this marriage. I'm for this relationship. I'm wanting this to work out. I'm going to make, I'm going to do everything it takes to make it work out. But the one least committed, they control the destiny of that relationship. That's not a good thing, folks. <laughs> You're thinking, hmm, he done gave me a little secret here. The less committed I am, I can direct this thing whichever way I want it to go. No, no, a thousand times no. If you're committed, I used to tell someone, uh, uh, another family had come to me one time and said, I'm willing to go 50-50 with my wife. And the wife was standing right there and she looked at him. In her mind, she thought, probably thought, you've never been more than 5% the whole time. <laughs> so this was a big upgrade. <laughs> Man, they had to reboot the whole marriage. <laughs> I looked at them and I said, this marriage is destined for doom. They both looked at me. They almost gathered together, came against the pastor. What do you mean, Brother Pavlo, it's destined for doom? I said, if you're only 50% in this, you're gone. You're sunk. Because the day you give less than 100%, either one of you, this marriage is destined for doom. Well, it doomed them too. <laughs> Never did see much of them anymore. In fact, I think they're both remarried somewhere, someplace. But there's a reality. There's a reality that we have to understand that whenever we often try to have a relationship with someone, we do it with certain controls. We do it with certain requirements instead of giving 100% of ourselves. You're saying, Brother Pavley, why are you saying this? Are you talking about the family? No, I'm talking about your relationship with God. Because we try to use these concepts in our relationship with the Lord. We try to tell him what to do. Or we do just enough to get by or to not get in trouble with him. We're not 100% committed. So we're trying to control the relationship. Our prayer meetings become just little sessions of, God, I want you to do this. And God, I want you to do that. And God, if you go take care of this. And, and God, my prayer today, here's, here's my laundry list, God. I want you to do all these things for me. But who's the one that died at Calvary? Who's the one that hung on the cross? Who's the one that gave 100%? Why don't you say, God, I'm going to give back 100%, and I want you to control my life. I want you to direct my path. I want you to walk ahead of me and guide my footsteps. God, you're in control. I relinquish. I secede from my union, and I want to go to your union. Hallelujah. Hey. That's a quotable little quote. I, I just thought of that as I was. I wonder if I could say that again, Brother Jeremy. I secede from my union because I want to be. How did I say that? I want to be a part of your union or I want to go to your. I, I already forgot. That's the thing about inspiration. Somebody comes to me after I preach and they say, What did you mean by that? And I say, I don't have a clue. When I was under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, 
Now, now I don't blame everything on the Holy Ghost, folks. Because sometimes I say some stupid things behind the pulpit. But whenever it's an inspiration, hey, I don't remember it five minutes. Brother Jeremy knows what I'm talking about. I don't, I don't remember it five minutes later. Whenever he gave his all at Calvary, how much more should we want to say, God, not my will, thy will be done. Not my way, but your way. Amen. And by the way, I just kind of feel off track right now. All you folks that you think, okay, this is my world, this is my house, this is my car, this is my clothes, this is my, my, my. Let's ask you that question a hundred years from now. Whose is it then? I want to go deeper into that for one moment because it's been on my mind a lot lately. A lot of times, and, and I'll find myself saying, oh, my foot is hurting. Oh, my, oh, my back is hurting. Is it your foot? Is it your back? Is it your body? Do you own this thing? How, how did some guy once say it that was a real strong conservative guy? It said, own loan from God. Y'all remember that? Own loan from God. This body is just loan to me. This is not my body. I am a steward of my body. But share me, would I embarrass you if I were to say I commend you? Many of you see he's only half the man he used to be. Stand up, brother Jeremy. Some people really stand. <laughs> Look at this man. Look at this man. He would have given Mrs. Shaver a run for her money just shorter back then. But look at him now. Thank you, brother Jeremy. <laughs> Things don't happen by accident. Things don't happen by coincidence. The other day, whenever I try, I used to always do my exercise and my 30 minutes of elliptical and all my other exercises. I used to always do it in the morning. And I got to the place where as I got older, I'd be so wiped out when I got up in the morning. After sleeping, I'd be all wiped out. So I shifted. I, I now do this in the evening. And the other day, it was, I was, it was an exhausting day, and I'd done a lot of things. And I, I looked at Sister Pavlou, and I said, Babe, you know, it would be easy for me to skip this workout today. But I said, but my body is not my body. I'm a steward of this body. God is letting me use this body. And it is my responsibility to take care of it. Now, I'm not here to beat you down on exercise and then blah, blah, blah. You know, one of our favorite ministers around here is Brother Ronnie Lacombe. And he don't mind me saying this because I've heard him say it behind the pulpit. I said, 20 years ago, I said, Brother, Brother Lacombe, you, you need to start exercising, and you need to lose weight. He had just had a heart attack. And I said, you need to do that. And he said, whoo, that doesn't sound like fun. <laughs> and losing weight doesn't taste too good. <laughs> he is amazing. But you know what the reality is? I do not want to become a slave to this body. I don't want to become a slave to this body. 
Therefore, because God loaned me this body, I'm going to exercise it. I'm going to put the right time of food in it, like shrimp and fajitas and on Father's Day. <laughs> Is my time up? Oh, no. 53, 52, part one. <laughs> Pastor Jared, part one. I, I, I got past the introduction. <laughs> Shall we stand this morning? I want to be a wise steward. I want to build battlements around my life, around my family, around my children. I want to be a battlement builder because I don't want that house with that nice, pleasant, flat roof to become potential destruction for someone else because I did not take the time to build a hedge, to build a fence, to build a battlement around my life, around my world, around my family, around my church. That's why I pray for this church. That's why Pastor Jared prays for this church. That's why we always seek the very best for this church because we're battlement builders. I wish I could go back and look back at my life and I look at my children sometimes and I've always tried to be so fair. Sister Pavlin and I have always worked at being so, so equal with them that whether it was Corey or Jared or Lena, equal attention, equal time, equal effort to be a part of their lives. Now, Pastor Jared being my son, of course, he got some uniquely different attention because he was my only son. But we always tried to be so fair. We worked at it. We didn't want them to ever get the attitude or feeling or fear that dad or mom cares about me more or the other one more than they do about me. Sister Pavley does that with the grandchildren now. They're not in here. They're at Kid City. And she, she goes every now and then, gives one of them a $5 bill and says, now you don't tell the other six. You're the only one because you're special to me. And she does it to all seven of them. And I get, I go more broke and more broke her showing her love to her grandkids. <laughs> pray, saints, pray. But equal effort. But I look back at life, and there's only one thing I would do differently. And I remember years ago, I told this church, I said, if you ever try to make me choose between you, talking about this church, and my family, you'll lose every time. Remember me saying that? That's always been my motto. But if I had it to do again, all the effort, energy, and time I put into the church, I would have revised that a little bit and I'd have put a whole lot more into my family. Don't misunderstand me. I did put a lot of time into my family but I would have put a whole lot more because when it's all said and done, if you make it to heaven, wonderful. Oh, that's wonderful. That's what it's all about. But if my kids don't make it, it is the tragedy of all tragedies. Battlement builders. Battlement builders. I don't want them to fall off the edge while I'm busy about my wheat and my oat, my barley and my flax sitting on top of the house. Saul hiding himself amongst the stuff. Didn't even know what it was. It may have been barley he was hit in. May have been wheat he was hit in. Saul 
was on the roof, hidden amongst the stuff, the king of Israel. A lot happens on the roof of your spiritual house. Build a battlement, a wall of safety, a wall of protection, a wall of security, a wall of love. Battlement. Builders. God bless you. This time we'll be calling for our ministerial team to come forward at this time. I love this church. Love all of you. You're all so precious and so special. And my, in our pastor doing a great job. Let's give him one great big applause. Amen. Amen. God bless you. And say, sing if you have a need. If you just want to tell the Lord, God, I want to do more. I want to serve you in a deeper measure. Or if you're here today saying, I want to start right now. This is going to be my beginning. I'm going to build a battlement. I may have never lived for God before, but I'm going to start today. You're welcome to come. God bless you. Appreciate every one of you being in the house of the Lord. Appreciate all of you. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm going to see your victory. I'm going to see your victory. For the battle. God in this place right now that can meet that need and where we talked about this a few weeks ago but where you are you can make that place your altar and at that place you can surrender yourself and you can say God whatever we got right now whatever is in the way in me God I want to put it out of the way and I want to let you in God let it be a union between me and you God that I give a hundred percent but I but you are totally in control God so right now if you have a need if you need the Holy Ghost if you need God to touch your life if you need God to meet you where you are and help you to begin to be a battlement builder in your family and a battlement builder with your kids and a battlement builder in your life if you need God to help you with that can you lift your hands up towards heaven and say God wherever the holes are in my armor wherever the things are around me that I have yet to fix God point me to that so I can pick up the, 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 the tools and, and, and go and become a battlement builder in that place, Lord. Right now, lift your hands and I'm going to pray that God will give you unique direction in your life to fix these, these areas. Each and every one of us have them. God, open our eyes. Father, in the name of Jesus, every single person in this room, every single person online, I pray, God, that the power of the Holy Ghost will enter in right now, God. Show us, Lord, with clarity what we need to work on in our lives. God, let us be battlement builders for you, Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus. Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Lord, show us, God. Let your glory fall. Let your grace fall. In Jesus' name. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Yeah, you take, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good.
Thanks for joining our online worship experience. We hope it has been a blessing to you and your family. We would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, or you can go to www.point.church and connect with us there. If you'd like to partner with us in giving, you can download our app, or you could go to point.church and click give. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to worshiping with you again soon.